Welcome, listeners. Before we start the show, I wanted to remind you guys of a very, very exclusive offer, which is essentially a, our Patreon WhatsApp Boys in the Cave chat that, mashallah, like, alhamdulillah, I think it's probably one of the best WhatsApp threads you can be on in, in history, to be honest, because, like, the amount of, mashallah, like, knowledgeable people that are there, because we do add our guests from the show onto that chat, as well as our very insightful um, listeners that are um, Patreon members who are on the chat as well. You know, there's a, you know, mashallah, very amazing discussions happen. So so we have the sort of guests that we do have on the Patreon WhatsApp chat is the likes of Dr. Jonathan Brown, Asadullah Ali, Dr. Samir Mahmoud, Tariq Tamar. We also have the likes of, you know, Mohammed Taba, Mohammed Ishaq, and many, many others as well. So you definitely don't want to miss out such an opportunity. So we have even sheikhs on it, like Sheikh Omar Baloch, Sheikh Osta, for example. So you definitely don't want to miss this opportunity to be in the same chat as such wonderful thinkers and brilliant minds and the sort of discussions that we have. So if you want to be part of the inside conversations definitely definitely join our patreon page our five dollar patreon tire inshallah you can join us in the whatsapp group so all you have to do is go patreon.com slash boys in the cave it's five dollar patreon tire and at the same time you're also also benefiting our project to keep on going smoothly and at the same time also better our production quality and inshallah we can improve better and then think about going into video and that can only be done through your help so inshallah i hope people jump on to that and look into that and also at the same time benefit bitc so thanks for that and i'll get into the show inshallah so i hope you enjoy the show It's all good, but it's it's worked out. But um, I guess why I wanted to have you on because uh, essentially, firstly, you're pretty much you know a bulldogs legend, and I guess being like you know, me as a as a Muslim, um, essentially growing up, uh, in in Sydney, right? So I'm I'm currently like 22, right? And so what, as I was growing up, um, I guess also after like 9/11, you're sort of as a young Muslim kid, you're trying to latch onto some role models that you find um, essentially within the community and i guess um in in the sort of um you know media spotlight or in in the sports arena that's sort of where you're looking to and i guess you were the actually the probably the only few that were in in that sort of limelight and maybe i think anthony mundine to an extent as well but um and it, you know, I guess you would have had this sort of told to you many times. I guess from uh, many people around my age, especially that you were pretty much the only one. And mashallah, you know, you've upheld this like amazing image, and you've you know represented the community amazingly. Um, so it's been you know, uh, it's like a given in in that sense that you've given back so much to the community that you know I just wanted to have you on to sort of you know unpack a lot of the stuff that you know through your career or through um your experiences in the community you know how it's all been a journey so um again yeah thank you for sort of coming on you know mel award drew as well my pleasure my brother alhamdulillah and thank you for your kind words and um alhamdulillah allah chooses everybody for for you know um certain jobs and alhamdulillah i've been put in that position to be able to sort of make a difference and um i love what i do alhamdulillah for that purpose in particular especially in Spartan. You know, young Muslim, um, you know, brothers and sisters that they can they, they can achieve and then they can inspire to be someone, inshallah. So, alhamdulillah for the gift. Um, um, you know, I mean, we could never take it for granted, and um, and therefore, um, inshallah, we can have a lot more people, like, you know, successful um, like yourself and like um, a lot of the brothers out there as well and the sisters. You know, what I mean, and they are really they, they are very much capable of doing so. Definitely. And I guess that's what I wanted to sort of um, ask you as well, in the sense that have you felt the pressure because you were in the limelight in a really tricky situation when it comes to, you know, after 9-11, for example, um, you know, Muslim community under the pump, you were sort of in the limelight. Did you feel that pressure, whether it be from, you know, um, within the NRL sort of um, limelight or even amongst the Muslim community that you sort of had to uh, represent the Muslim community in the up upmost manner and sort of had to uphold yourself in such a such a way where you know you were true to your faith and you were representing the community did you feel that you had that pressure i'm um, at the back of your mind when it comes to when you were like playing um rugby um for bulldogs uh brother look if i if i you know if i if i say no i'll be lying to you but um the amount of pressure i was under especially early on um you know obviously i made my debut in the 90s 
uh, you know, 96 and that. And then from there on, um, there was a lot of, a lot of controversies, you know what I mean? Whether um, it was, a, I don't know how to describe it because it was a really, a very a testing decade. Um, and that decade was on both sides for myself, from a Bulldogs perspective and from a Muslim perspective as well. So there was so many things that sort of, subhanAllah, were cramped up in that particular decade. And, um, if, you know, and if you want, if I wasn't, alhamdulillah, a man of faith and a resilient type of person, I would have really, really sort of, um, uh, t- you know, I mean, how can I say, tested me out or, or, or made me go, you know, a different directions because, um, it all sort of happened back to back, back to back. It started off obviously in 97, um, where the Super League war is to, two competitions divided. Um, you know, not knowing what's happening. Then of, uh, you know, then uh, that, that's, that's from a Bulldogs perspective. Then to, you know, 2001. You had um, the 9-11, then 2002, um, uh, we had uh, the salary cap dramas from the Bulldogs, 2000, I think, and three, uh, or, or even before that, we had the, we had the SCAF, um, uh, you know, rape and all that with the Lebanese boys and all that. So uh, there was a lot of, lot of tension there and there was a lot of questions asked by everybody, you know. So um, and then, of course, it goes back, it goes to um, – uh, uh, the Coffs Harbour dramas that we had as a Bulldogs, um, you know what I mean? That we had um, the as Muslims, the Corona riots. Um, uh, uh, so it, it just kept going on and on. So every year or two, there was something coming up, whether it's, a, you know, where it was a Bulldogs or it was um, as a Muslim, you know. So um, uh, you had the Bali bombings all happening at the same time as well, you know. So there was just so many things cramped up in that decade. And some whole other questions were being thrown at me and, um, you know, being alhamdulillah in, 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 in the limelight and being, a, you know, a Muslim, everybody wanted to find out and know. And I, I had to I had to sort of um, uh, take it all on board Um uh, you know, answer them in a in a most positive way. Uh, try to highlight what Islam is all about, and it's not the individuals. And of course, I had to perform on the field as well, which is extremely difficult to be able to sort of juggle a couple of you know a couple of things all at once with the amount of pressure um, that um, the game uh, itself brings on. So, look, alhamdulillah, in saying that. Um, uh, it's all about having the right family and friends around you, and and and, uh, and of course, you know the faith. Your faith plays a major role, um, and yeah, just uh, alhamdulillah, we were able to sort of um, get through that period. Alhamdulillah, it seems yeah, it there was just so much going on. I know, like I guess nowadays it's like we do, like I guess the Muslim community still go through quite a lot. But in your sort of time when you were playing, there was just like drama after drama after drama. And as well as you just mentioned, I assume as a sports player, it's already tough enough to be, you know, going through training, for example, and dealing with the NRL stuff. But then you're sort of having this baggage being like, you know, Muslim Lebanese, being a representative in the community where you had to fulfill those obligations as well. So it becomes like, really hard to juggle both and i guess a lot of people don't realize that as well so i guess it was really interesting with your insights you know may allah will truly reward you for those sort of struggles and you know mashallah you've made the most out of it because you know in as a, as a muslim sort of growing up as i mentioned earlier you know you were sort of that ideal role model that we can sort of look up to and i also wanted to ask like in in saying that i assume that because i read i was reading an article um where you, you sort of mentioned i guess at times maybe the uh, maybe the Lebanese or the Muslim community were may have been a bit more critical. And so I wanted to ask you as a follow-up question where I know that you had to sort of represent the community, but did you feel at times as you were doing that, sometimes essentially if people in your own community were like, sort of uh, criticizing you as well and that kind of put more pressure in, in that sense because you were thinking, you know, or may you may have been thinking that, okay, look, I'm trying to represent the community, but the Muslim community at times can be very ruthless and very critical. So it becomes even harder to deal with that. So did you have that sort of um, dynamic or that aspect to deal with as well? Uh, look, of course I did. But uh, um, for me, again, I went, you know, the period I was in, there wasn't much Muslims, um, uh, athletes or or, um, or high-profile uh, personnel in, in, uh, in the community at that time. Um, you mentioned Anthony Mundine. He reverted late in the 90s, um, but with all due respect to the brother Mundine, he probably sometimes caused a lot more controversy because he was trying to get things across 
um, without explaining to the public. And therefore, that there was more scrutiny um, and more questions being asked by myself, you know what I mean? Um, because obviously he was a new um, into Islam. So uh, people just wanted to find out what exactly he was talking about. Um, uh, look, in saying that too, again, no matter how you handle the situation, I never, I never put my hand up to be a representative of the Muslims and all that. I wanted to represent myself and my religion, of course, but I, I, the point I'm trying to make is that I didn't want to be, um, how can I say, uh, in, in a position um, where I have to answer controversial questions to people. Um, you know, that's not my position. I'm here as a sportsman. I'm here as an athlete. I want to perform to the best of my ability and spread positive messages. Um, but unfortunately, you know, you've been put in a spotlight and people want to find out and, and, and they keep, they, you know, they want to, they want to make you the spokesman. And I'm not a spokesman for these type of things. You know, I mean, I've always said that. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I let my actions do the talking, but you, 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 you've, you've thrown, you know, you're thrown in that position in the deep end and you expect some kind of, you know, I mean, um, as I said, help from your own people. Um, unfortunately, sometimes they throw you under the bus because everybody's got their own agenda. Um, unfortunately, we come, uh, you know, and I see it a lot even now. They're happy to step on top of you and criticise you so they, they can be in that role instead of actually combining hands together and working together as one one form of, um, um, uh, you know, society to be able to sort of um, – um, to be able to, to, to combat anything that comes along from um, um, from from you know, any outside noise, for example. So um, uh, we we obviously you know um, suffer from the tall poppy syndrome. There's no doubt about that. Um, and um, but look to me, bro, I do, I've always sort of put that behind me. I didn't worry me. I um, I went about my jobs. Um, I've had people come up and criticize my footy and criticize the. The, the you know the the players and the coach and the game plan and everything and yet they've never played the game of rugby league so to me you can say whatever you want I'm just going to listen you know what I mean and not take anything on board because with all due respect to you you know you're not in that environment you don't know what happens so therefore thank you very much but you know I'll just move I'll keep moving forward in my own um, you know listening to the right people with their right expertise that's actually an interesting point you bring up like i'm essentially you having to, like a lot of people i guess now you see on facebook where you know they have comments after comments about criticism and criticism and everyone's just like chiming in and it's like i, I assume like when you were playing as well you had to deal with that on top of all the baggage when it comes to you know being a representative of the community so that would have just been compiled after you know it would have uh sort of increased and it would have added to more of the pressure I guess and subhanAllah you know truly may I reward you and I also wanted to ask like essentially um, going back to maybe I just wanted to touch on your childhood I know that um, you've actually have spoken about sort of your childhood struggles in um, in documentary you did and also um, I think a, um, an interview that you did before however I wanted to ask because Essentially, you've talked about how, you know, your father struggled to get work. He came from, you know, war-torn Lebanon at age of 12. Essentially, you had to, you know, share a room with five sibling, siblings every night. And so, would you say that those sort of struggles that you went through as a young kid essentially shaped you to um, be who you are today when it comes to, you know, being able to be successful in a, you know, high-quality, high, com- highly competitive um, competition like the NRL? Absolutely. Um you know, I share these stories a lot of times when I go to schools and I do programs and all that. You know, I mean, just to uh, you know to give the kids an example. You know, I mean that um, that self entitlement doesn't always. You know, I mean doesn't always. Ha- you know, I mean, you can't always ask for that. You know, there's uh, there's struggles out there. You need to be able to strive and work. And sometimes, you know, when you go through the the tough period of time, that's what sort of shapes you, builds you, and makes you a resilient person moving forward because no matter what happens moving forward, you've that that foundation is built strong and nothing can destroy that, you know. So for me, you know, again, as I said, uh, you know, spending all that time with my siblings, you know, sharing that one one room, like you're saying, dad been through there. I, I, I had to grow up from such an early age, from a war-torn, you know, 
in Lebanon. I was the oldest um, boy in the family. Sister is, I've got a sister that's older than me, so I practically had to go with my dad to get bread in the middle of the night when there's no electricity and there's snipers and people, you know what I mean? Um, there's bombs in, in the ground so, we, you know, so we can feed the rest of the family and our neighbours as well. So at the age of, say, 10 and 11, so these things, you know, haunt me to these days and stay in my memory. And, um, and again, you know, you come out to Australia and you think, you know, at the beginning that, you know, you think everything is going to be just beautiful and all that, and it was. But again, the struggles continue, and I'm talking financially here. Um, you know, being able to sort of, um, my dad had to sort of, you know, get his license to try to get, you know, I mean, a car. And then within the first two, three weeks, you know, I mean, something happened to the car, for example, you know, what I mean, so therefore he's in more debt um, to bring family of five. And then my sister was born two years later. Um, you know, financially it was tough, so we didn't arrive to Australia um, uh, in. in um, uh, we didn't arrive with money at all. We arrived in debt. We still had to pay people overseas that we borrowed money to be able to sort of pay for our own ticket for long for, as I said, for five kids, including mum and dad. So, and you're off to Australia here, you know what I mean? You can't just sleep over any, uh, you know, your uncles or your aunties' places because we're a big family. So they had to get, um, you know, a unit, uh, a unit, two bedroom unit for us and furnish it so we can at least move in straight away and, and sleep. So again, that's, there's more debt there for my father and all that to be able to pay off that later on and he's trying to get work try to learn the language it was really extremely difficult time you know especially that time i think we landed in australia we landed in a time of a recession as well i think the interest rate interest rates at the time was 17 or 18 percent so it was tough times from an economy uh, you know for, for everybody and, and for us it was even tougher um we had to uh, numerous times go see, um, you know, seek Salvation Army, um, Smith family, um, you know, to, to help out, um, you know, the, the, you know, the, 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 the Muslim, um, um, whatever it was at the time there that uh, we had to sort of, um, go in, um, and, and, you know, just try to get, even if it's like, for example, food vouchers or whatever it is, you know, I, I still talk about my first, pair of boots that I have bought them secondhand from the markets and um, that's something I'm very proud of because it just shows people that I never had a silver spoon in my mouth I never had at the beginning like everybody else I never had all these things but yeah you know I have you know I have no how can I say no regret whatsoever to me that's what I'm built on that's what um, makes me so, you know, as I said, resilient and in a way with Allah's faith, unbreakable. Uh, you know what I mean? That's the way there's – no matter what you're going to throw at me, um, it's not going to break me with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Th- those are just, you know, subhanAllah, some crazy um, situations and you were essentially a um, young child as well. And I guess what I could add to that is that, you know, you essentially had to be a man at that age. And so, I, interesting enough, you also work with, I guess, um, the younger kids in the community, where, whether it be through, you know, community work or even um, coaching kids. What do you observe in the sense that, like, what's the trajectory you've seen um, from yourself when it comes to working with kids? Like, what are their biggest struggles um, at the moment? Because I assume that you, perhaps the reason why you work with um, kids a lot and you find passion in that is because, you know, you, you've had to go through the struggle yourself. So what's been your sort of um, experience with um, kids in general and what sort of um, struggles uh, have, have, I guess, the kids now are um, are going through at this um, point in time and what do you advise for those sort of kids as well? Yeah, look, um, I, I, look I, I love sharing my story because a lot of them, um, you know, always sit, sit back and go, oh, look, you don't know what it's like. You don't understand. I'm like, try me. <laughs> and then when they go, oh, look, you know, uh, for example, I've had a tough one. I've had a tough here. I've had a tough here. And I said, mate, I've been through it. I've been through so much. And, you know, at times, subhanAllah, you know, like you, I know, you you know, you're meant to say alhamdulillah for everything, but, you know, as a human being, you always question why me, why me? And you know what? It takes a lot of times later on to know that's why, you know what I'm saying? So everything happens for a reason. And a lot of, a lot of times what I, what I went through, it's like, oh, like, why does it have to be me, for example? You know, you can't help as a human being just question that every now and then, but always say, alhamdulillah, and be grateful. 
Um, and therefore, now it comes to the time when people say, oh, look, for example, um, you know, we never had anything growing up. I was, you know, I'm like, yeah, well, there you go. I've been through, for example, I came here as a refugee. I didn't speak English. Thank you very much. Same here. I, um, you know, I mean, endured one, two, and three when I was younger. Yeah, well, I've been through that as well. So there's a lot of things there that is so similar and um, and I can relate to the kids. And that's why, alhamdulillah, I get on with the majority of them because it's, Look, one, sports unifies people. Two, is that a bit of games and all of a sudden you're sitting there and you sort of, they open up and they chat and they, a lot of the kids, what they're missing, they look, their self-esteem is always down. I find that they, 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 there's a sense of belonging that they're missing out that, um, you know, you, you sort of in limbo where you're sort of a Muslim, you know, Lebanese, Australian or Australian Lebanese and, um, you know, you might go overseas for a bit and they call you Aussie or Australian over there and you come here and they call you Lebanese over here and you're like, so which one, like there's a sense of belonging there, you know. So, um, uh, again, I just, I mean, until I'm the sky's the limit, all you can do is just do your best, no matter what obstacles you're going to be faced with, and I've been faced with a lot, you just have to overcome it. You have to be resilient. You have to be strong mentally. So, therefore, when you get to the top, nothing can break you, and um, no matter what. And as I said, again, I went through so much, but yet when it came to sort of training or game, I was like a switch. I'll switch on or off, you know. So, come game time, nothing could block my vision. I knew what I wanted and what I wanted to achieve throughout that game or training, for example, and it was a, a you know it was a switch that I'll switch on, play the game, whatever, and then I'll deal with the problems after, you know. So after training or whatever, so I didn't want anything affecting me mentally and physically, you know, because let's face it, it doesn't matter it doesn't matter how big and strong and fast and whatever you are, if mentally you're not there, you're not there. So would you say even when you were a um, younger child and you, you've detailed um, the struggles that you went through, essentially sport, um, because you mentioned uh, in past interviews that you did play soccer uh, early on. So sports like soccer and rugby league were sort of outlets for you when it comes to escaping those sort of struggles that you were going through. Is that why you invested in sports at a young age as well? Absolutely. Look, I, I, I played, as I said, soccer overseas, um, uh, just in the neighbourhood. And... Um, uh, again, it's just it's something. It's a it's 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 a relief. It's something that you know you 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 forget about the outside world, whatever is happening, and you're actually in that moment. And um, you know you're enjoying it, you're socializing with with the people, and you're competing. And that environment always attracted me to it, and um, it made me just forget about whatever problems I was faced before you know and um and therefore you know i enjoyed the moment of playing competing or whatever it is and then after that you sort of go back of dealing with the problems or dealing with it so it's definitely an outlet for me um you know i found that to be um just a relief absolute relief Mashallah. and i guess you've also mentioned uh, in the past how you were scouted but I also wanted to ask because essentially looking at your stats alone, um, of course, mashallah, you know, did fantastically well as a winger. But I guess people are more familiar as well with the uh, conversions that you took, right? And how many, you know, the amount of points that you amassed when it comes to taking conversions. I guess uh, if listeners aren't from Australia, essentially taking conversions is similar to, I guess, NFL, where there's like golf posting, you try to kick the ball, kick the um, rugby league um, footy through um, the posts. And essentially, let's just say you were just a master of that. And I wanted to hone in on this aspect because I personally play a lot of cricket and I personally love sports a lot because there's a lot of mental game to it. Um, there's a lot of mental sort of um, ability that's required. And essentially, I think, I don't know. I, first, I just wanted to ask, like in regards to taking conversion specifically, is that something that you've always practiced, um, you know, hard out as a youngster while you're playing football or was it kind of uh, playing rugby, sorry, and essentially kind of, uh, you know, you sort of got and picked a door when you were uh, playing for Bulldogs or was it something that you took seriously, you know, for example, around the time you just got into the um, Bulldogs team, for example? Yeah, look, uh, with goal kicking, I, I was never a goal kicker. I, I played soccer. Um, playing the soccer and kicking a soccer ball is much different to kicking a rugby league ball. Um I, um, I, uh, you know, I played, as I said, I made, I made the Bulldogs team, so I played for about five years. So from 96, I made my debut. Uh, 2001, 
to, or near 2000, Daryl Halligan, one of the, you know, like um, they used to call him the uh, the super boot. So he was uh, one of the best kickers going around and, uh, you know, he retired. So they, you know, they threw it out there. There was a couple of kickers in our team, um, whoever wanted the opportunity, opportunity to, to take it. Um, can do so, and you know, obviously, we're putting a lot of hard work in the, in the off season, which is about you know, say three months, and then um, we had a little bit of a like a sort of um, uh, you know, a small competition, I guess, and see who's going to take over the kicking. And I sort of put my hand up as well, and I wanted the job, and um, so I went away, practice as much as I can, practically every day. Um, I never had the foundation like everybody, like a lot of these kickers currently now, where they they kick in their junior junior league, um, you know, and, um, and again, they get to, I think, reserve grade or whatever it is, and they, um, and then they to, to first grade. So I never had that opportunity. I never kicked beforehand. As I said, five years, which are almost 100 games later, um, I took over kicking. And, um, I, you know, look, I wanted the job. And it just shows you, again, uh, another thing I always tell, um, you know, some of the young kids that if you want something that, that badly, you know what I mean, you're going to have to put in your work. And if you do, mate, you'll get it because, you know, you've got to have, you've got to have pride in everything that you do. And, um, uh, and that's me. I wanted that job that badly that I went out every single day, practically every single day. Even sometimes when I took over, when I, when I ended up getting a job, even at game day, um, if we playing that night, I'd go out in the morning and just have a few, you know, although I, I probably had too much because I was, um, you know, ended up sort of hindering a little bit of my performance through, you know, you tighten, tightened up my body, but I needed to lay the foundation. I needed that, that uh, you know, that amount of work. So therefore, when I get behind the ball, I had that same rhythm. I had that same um, vision that I, um, you know, that that's it. I knew exactly what I wanted to. And, you know, it took me probably two years um, and until I sort of, Every time I got behind the ball, I knew exactly where it was going to go. I knew uh, how I was going to control it. You know, I mean, obviously, you know, the weather played a part. Um, you know, the wind plays, you know, played a major part a lot of times. Injuries plays a part as well. So, um, but it took me a good two to three years to actually build that good foundation. You know, what I mean, where a lot of the kickers now have that through kicking through their junior leg and coming up. So, um, um, yeah, and that's sort of how I sort of come about. Like, mashallah, that's, like, very inspirational. I just wanted to hone in on one uh, specific moment you just mentioned in terms of when you were in training. And so you said that there was an, you know, opportunity for you to put your hand up and you essentially took that opportunity. And that kind of uh, reminded me that I guess it's a good lesson for everyone where the, if there is an opportunity uh, when it comes to seizing um, a, a, I guess, leadership position or a position in any sort of field. It could be at work or it could be in sport or wherever. You know, if there's an opportunity, just, you know, put your hand up. Even though, as you just explained, that you weren't really a goal kicker when you were younger, but you just took the opportunity, right? So a lot of people, when, for example, when they're at work, they won't put their hand up for positions that might be higher than their current roles because they think that they don't have the skills and won't be able to do it. But you've kind of... You know, um, bit of a pun but you kind of winged it at the beginning but then obviously you put in the hard work mashallah so what's your sort of take on that sort of aspect as well look but believe me it's not about i winged it i i believe you know what i mean and you gotta believe that's the thing about any person you, you gotta believe that you can do a certain job you know so um uh you know, so some people are, are sort of not courageous enough to put their, you know, best foot forward, even though they might be talented. And we have a lot of that in our Muslim community. A lot of them, um, you know, don't want don't want to put their best foot forward. They'd rather be reluctant and and be in that comfort zone. You got to get out of that comfort zone. You know, and if you can be, um, if you can play a, a major influence in, in you know, as I said, in the community or in a, in a, in a team or, or in, in work or in business and that, you have to be able to sort of do that, not in a dominating way, but, you know, obviously like in a, in a way where, um, you know, to to push forward and um, and have a, a positive impact on ev- any, uh, on everybody around you. So, um, you know, again, you got to be courageous. You got to be. You got to believe in yourself. If you don't believe in yourself, you're gonna be sort of behind that desk all your life. If you know what I'm saying, instead of being the person up front and you know being in a leadership role. So, uh, being able to sort of 
you know, being courageous and believe in yourself. And, um, and you know, you've got to have faith, man. You've got to have faith in yourself. And that we all have our limits. So sometimes trying to push yourself to that extra, you know you can do it. Is it laziness? Yes. On our, on our part, a lot of it is. Is it, um, is it um, you know, the doubt that kicks in? Mate, you're going to have to eliminate that doubt because that's what makes you, I mean, that's what makes ordinary people extraordinary, if you know what I'm saying. So it's that pushing that limit all, all the time. And once you achieve it, um, you go to the next one. And that's exactly what I'd done. I had in mind I wanted to take over a goal kick in. The first year I was, yeah, happy to, you know, go about it. But then after that, I sat back and I, you know what, I started writing down goals. I started running goals. I want to achieve this. I want to break this record for this year. I want to be able to, and I mean, do one, two, and three. I want my percentage to get better. And I took it seriously. I took it that serious that I actually got myself a black pen and a red pen. And I, I drew actually the map of the field. And every time, for example, I, I missed the kick, I highlighted it in the red pen where it was from. So therefore, end of the season, I revised and I looked at it and I thought, okay, I summarized everything and I said, okay, you know what? I keep much better on the left than the right. So I know where my weakness is. I've got to work on it. But I never stopped working on my strength as well so I can keep improving. Um, you know, and, and now it's all highlighted and now, you know, it's, it's different now because you can get go into, you know, go into the, say, on our old um, uh, uh, websites and probably get it all, um, uh, it's all highlighted there. But beforehand, we never had that technology. So I actually did it by myself, you know, I mean, I still actually got the papers that maybe one day I'll try to post them if I can. But, um um, so that's 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 what that the steps that you have to take to to improve. What advice would you give someone when it comes to eliminating that doubt and having that sort of self belief? Work. You got to work hard. You got to you got to ask the right questions with, for the right people. You can, you, you got to surround yourself with positive people um, and get their feedback. You know, we don't know everything ourselves. Uh, we all struggle in different departments. But if you want to. If you want to be able to, um, you know, uh, um, succeed, you're going to have to. You need help along the way. So you need to ask the right people in the right places, um, and and have a positive mind. To have a positive mind and get up, and you got to love what you do. If you don't love what you do, but you just want to get there for the money, mate, you'll get there for the money. But you hate, you'll hate that job that you're doing. You gotta you gotta love what you do. You gotta get up every morning, you know, with a, with a goal in mind. Okay, today I'm gonna, for example, you know. Train hard. I'm going to do one, two, and three. I'm going to be able to sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, have a positive impact um, on my teammates, on myself. I want to. I want to get something out of it. You're not just there uh, jumping on and off of the train, if you know what I mean, from one destination or another. You want to be able to sort of get to that destination um, and and play an impact, leave a legacy behind. And that's me. I wanted to leave a legacy behind. I wanted to be able to break records. And thank God. And the reason why is that because I wanted to show everybody, especially a, a young kid coming from Belmore, a non refugee visa, um, didn't speak English, within eight years played, you know, main first grade and left a legacy behind for all the young guys, in particular the Lebanese Muslim kids, to say, Oh, you know, when they sit there and they have that, oh, we can't make it. Oh, no, you know, we, the club doesn't give us a go. Oh, you know, I'm not good enough. No, listen, I had one or two years. That's all I played rugby league for. I played at the age of 18. I started through school year 11, year 12. And then, and then one junior league um, year, and then I was able to get chosen, uh, alhamdulillah, through that, and I just made the most of it. I had a good coach that – I become like a sponge. I listened to all, you know, I mean, he was a fullback and he said to me, you know what? He saw, he saw that I, I was, I was dedicated. He saw that I was, I had the right attitude and Stan Cutler, his name is, and he took me under his wing. So I'd make sure I'd ask him all the question, what position should I be? What this and that? I was learning something new from scratch and I, that was under 21. So it was still major. And yet I was came away, alhamdulillah, I got player of the year for that year and I made reserve grade, which is a big step within one year. Like no one, alhamdulillah, heard of me at the time. Within one year of playing rugby, junior rugby league, one year with the Bulldogs in 95, made reserve grade. And in 96, I was playing first grade. So within two years, I was playing first grade and people went, who's this guy? Where did he come from? So alhamdulillah, it's about the opportunities there. you got to make the most of it. you got to have the right attitude. You're going to have to uh, be a sponge and absorb everything on board. Um, and that's what I've done. I made sure I asked the right people. You know, I'll come up to Stan Cutler and I say, 
what should I have done, for example, in that position? What do you think I should do here? You know, I mean, where do I back up? How do I support? How do I go? You know, so all these things were new to me, but yet I was learning and I'm trying to perfect it game by game by game. And when people in, you know, as I said, coaches or business or, or, or um, bosses and that see a person sort of sincere and he might lack a few here and there, but he's got so much potential and he's willing to learn they will invest a lot of time in you. So everything relates back to your attitude as well. You know I mean? How you approach things and how you want things and how badly you actually want it. The, um, I think nowadays a lot of people might, might say might say that essentially, look, there is a lot of information out there. Or maybe people, a lot of people will tell you this advice and give you that advice and there's so much information to take in and sometimes it might be contradicting. But how would you sift through um, taking on board the right advice versus, you know, sort of um, leaving out the advice that you shouldn't take on board that someone may want to impose on you, if that makes sense? Look, to, to me, it's um, it's people that have done it beforehand, you know what I mean? So it's the people that have done it before, been in that position um, um, and are, are sincere. Um, so you can't sometimes, it's very easy to jump on Google or to jump on YouTube or you jump on, you know, Instagram or whatever or, or Facebook and, and social media and just go, okay, bang, you know, this guy's talking about that. But is he qualified enough? Is he the right person? You know what I mean? So everybody, everybody's everybody's bodies are different to everyone. You know, even in 40, for example, you have the forwards, they're bigger and you have the backs, they're smaller and speedier, for example. So, um, it can't be just generalized. So you're going to have to, again, ask the specific people that are in the know that specialize in these sort of department, whether it's, as I said, in the game of rugby league or cricket or whatever, or in sports or in business or whatever it is. So there's always someone that, um, you know, you feel comfortable with and sincerely, you know, that they're giving you the right advice, not because they want to boost you up with them as well. So again, you get a lot of people that uh, give you short answers because you know, they feel that you might be a threat to their position or to them or whatever it is. And, um, and uh, you know, some people are, let's just face it, face it, they just hate us. They don't want anybody else to succeed but themselves. You know what I mean? Others are, uh, you know, they, 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 they climb up and they drag people, people up with them. You know what I mean? Other people actually push people up first and then climb up. So, um, you know, that's up to every individual to find out the, you know, the most suitable person, but always the suitable person would be the person that actually experienced that themselves beforehand. I also wanted to ask in regards to, for example, training versus the actual game. So, for example, I can only speak from my specific like, cricket context. So, I would see, like, for example, a lot of players that look a million bucks in the net, you know, absolutely creaming it through the co covers or smashing big shots against these good bowlers. And then in the game, they can't, like, score any runs. So, they struggle a lot. So, it becomes like a sort of um, mental battle for them, for example, from translating their skills from training and incorporating it in the actual game where there's a bit more pressure etc so i assume maybe in the rugby league context that you may have witnessed a lot of players that are super talented in training but then you know in the game they're not you know at that 100 percent that they display in uh, uh sorry in the game which they don't display uh, in the game versus like in training where they look a lot better so how would you have you seen have you observed and seen that for yourself and what advice would you give when it comes to um, mindset and translating all your skills and um, pushing through those sort of crucial pressure moments um, in the actual game itself look uh, growing up especially when I first started all you hear about is oh this person's going to be a superstar this person's going to be a superstar this guy is made for example a certain grade this this person in particular you watch what he's going to achieve towards the end and um uh, unfortunately, none of them actually get to make it or play not even one game of first grade, you know. And and some of them, like you're saying, they train the house down, you know. They're like he's one of the fittest person. Um, when we're never doing any, you know, long Ks. Um, you know, sprint work is so quick and fast. But you know, come for example, game uh, game time, his self doubt comes. He might drop one ball, and all of a sudden, he goes into his shell. Um, again, like you're saying with the cricket, it's exactly the same thing as well. So um, every sport has it has, has that, and that self doubt always kicks in. But again, it boils down to your character. You know what I mean? I, can you able to actually absorb that? Can you take a punch and return ten? If you know what I mean. So these are the things when you're cornered and criticism uh, of of people, um, you know, is going to 
play a, a role. Um, you know, uh, your own community, for example, sometimes want to criticise you if you've had one or two games and people jump on board straight away. All it takes are one or two games and people go, oh, that's it, he's exposed. See, I told you it's not good enough. And it's up to you again to sort of, um, you know, rebuild that or um, or show that it's only a one-off or two-off or sometimes the opposition were just too good in that particular, for example, moment that, you know, there's not there's, there's, there's not much I, I could have done, for example. So, um, but you have to eliminate all self-doubt. Look, goal kicking is a, is, is one, mentally, it's, it's a lot more than actual just physical because you could be kicking 10, 15, 20 in a row and all of a sudden, you know, I mean, you miss one or two, or you cop an injury, for example, and all of a sudden, you, you know, you, there's two or three kicks in a row that you miss, and people start to go. And mind you, you you might miss them not by far. One might hit the post, one might shave the post a little bit. Um, you know, it could be windy, um, could be whatever it is. And people go, oh, look, you know, what's happening with your kicking? What's happening here? And then that's when mentally you actually have to sort of recuperate again and get yourself. Oh, look, I'm better than that, and self doubt kicks in. Um, you know, there, you know, there's, there's this happens a lot of times, especially in one game, you've missed two or three and you sort of feel like you've letting the team down. And, um, you know, and although it's just that they're all from the corners and they're all tough kicks and you're just missing them. But unfortunately, people don't know that because when they look at the scoreboard and say, you, for example, you've um, lost the game by two points, they're going to always go back and blame the goal kicker and say, listen, you know, if you, quick, if you kick two or three of them kicks, we would have won the game. But no one has been in that position to know how hard, for example, it is. You know, you can't control the weather. You've done, for example, you might have done everything right, but it still couldn't get it in. That doesn't mean that's your fault, for example. So self-doubt is always going to kick in. Um, it's something that you have to sort of always eliminate. You have to have faith. You know, I mean, you have to have faith in, in, in Allah. That's To me, that, I've always relied on that. You know what I mean? Throughout the game, before the game, after the game, I've always just made my supplications, my dua, you know what I mean? And... Uh, that's it. That's all I can do. I've done, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you, you know what I mean? Strive and I will strive with you. And that's exactly my motto through, been throughout my, my, um, my, my career is that I'd go out there and I'd leave no stone unturned. I'll make sure that I go out there and I train as hard as I can. I kick all the goals. I'm meticulous when it comes to, uh, you know, for example, my rehab and, and everything else that I'll do. And I'll just go to the game. I have no regrets. I, I miss, oh, look, I did. I did everything that I could. There's nothing more that I could have done. If there is, and I didn't tick that box, then I can blame myself, you know. I'd even go back, even if I missed a couple of kicks, I'd go back home, for example, and um, throughout the night, I, you know, the adrenaline's still pumping. I can't I can't sleep, but I'd watch the game. Um, I'd, 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 I'd analyse myself. I'm, I used to be my harshest uh, um, critic. Why? Because I want to know why I missed you know what did I wrong did I do there so I can actually improve on that, um, and and you know look sometimes when things are not going so well no matter the harder you try sometimes the worse it gets that's unfortunately how it is but the advice I'd give to some of the young guys then stick to basics and build build it slowly again you know so sometimes you try too hard and it's it it, it becomes worse you make more mistakes and then that dents your confidence a, a lot more um, and affects your game. So therefore, sometimes until you um, build that confidence again, just stick to basics, you know what I mean? Go back um, a, a step to gain another, say, five or ten forward again. So, um, yeah, that's my advice, my brother. MashaAllah. And just to add as well, where I assume as a, when you're taking, um, when you're goal kicking, the crowd, you know, if you're in sort of enemy territory, you know, the crowd is probably going wild behind you. You have to block that noise or if it's like really windy and, you know, or even if it's a pressure situation in a game, like it's, I don't know, 18-18, you're taking a conversion to win the game. Like all those things are like just in crazy scenarios where you have to sort of, um, as you just mentioned, have that self-belief and able to do and that kind of assists you um, yeah. along the way. And the confidence, alhamdulillah, brother, plays a big part. You know I mean? Having faith, of course, but... You need to. Like, again, you, you spoke about people heckling you on the sideline. I used to get that so much, you know, like everywhere you go. But subhanAllah, when I told that story to people, go, oh, really? And I go, yeah, that's exactly. I actually used to love it. And the reason why I used to love it, because just in case I wasn't concentrating enough, by getting heckled and people on the sideline, um, you know, saying all these terrible things and whatever it is, it actually put me in the zone a lot more. And 
when I'm in the zone, it made me concentrate a lot more and I was more determined to get it and I, th- th- than any other time. And once I kick it and it goes in, I used to just turn around and give them a little glimpse and and a, and a bit of a wave sometimes, you know what I mean? And um, and, and I, I used to love these moments, you know. So uh, every goal kicker's dream is to kick that goal, for example, from the sideline or to be faced with one so you can prove yourself. And alhamdulillah, no, I was faced with numerous of them on numerous times. And, um, and, you know, as I said, you come through. So, again, it's just the preparation that you do for that particular moment. And as well, you mentioned before, I, I also read an article where it said the secret to your um, conversion success is saying a prayer before you take, um, take the kick. So I assume like you'd say a dua or something before every um, kick that you took, essentially. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, that's a must, you know. So uh, at the end of the day, everything you can do um, is, is, you know, I mean, is within your hands. But ultimately, it's in the hands of Allah. So if you're meant to, if you're meant to um, get it, you're meant to get it. If you're not, you're not. And um, uh, at times, brother, when I sort of watch some of the kicks, I think to myself, there's no way, for example, I should have kicked this kick and somehow, subhanAllah, how I went in with the conditions and all that, I don't know. And then subhanAllah, sometimes I think I've done everything right here. You know, my my rhythm towards the ball was good. I followed through. I I I I drove the ball exactly how I wanted it from say from right to left. And subhanAllah, it just didn't come around, it stayed as it is and it didn't go in there. So so look, alhamdulillah, it's meant to be. That's the way it is. You know, you can do everything you can off the field and you know, on the field. Um and at the end of the day is what well, Allah wills, Allah wills, subhanAllah. SubhanAllah. And I also wanted to ask because clearly rugby league, um, because we were touching a lot more on the mental side, but clearly rugby league is has to be one of the most physically draining sports out there, uh, in the sense of the amount of running or, you know, taking, you know, running with the ball and um getting tackled or tackling as well. Um, even like under the high ball, all that sort of stuff requires a lot of um explosiveness and energy and, and cardio and, and strength and muscle as well. So for yourself, what was the training regime like um, when you were playing in the NRL? Like, how often would you be training? Would every training session um, include like gym work? And were you also very meticulous in terms of um, your diet as well when it came to um, approaching games, for example, the sort of build that you wanted to have when it comes to um, strength or, or muscle um, for the game specifically as well? Yeah, look, um, it's a good question. And um, again, I talk about that a lot to some of the young kids that want to ask and how with their preparation. And um, um, look, I'll start off with the eating the right food because you have to. You cannot, um, they test you every, say, five to six weeks. Um, they go in there and they do a skin uh, fold test. And if you exceed that by, say, four or five meals, then you know what? You, you're in the, the the fat squad they call it, which you know you're back in there doing extras all the time. Um, uh, you know you, you, your food, you need to eat the right food. Obviously, as a, as an athlete, the carbohydrates have to be increased, and um, and um, you know, yeah, you know, the, obviously your sugars and all that. You know, you have to sort of watch what and the protein, everything. You know, like the normal type of food, then that to obviously build muscle and. Um, uh, to keep increasing uh, your speed and all that, so um, and not to uh, obviously put on weight. So um, it's probably not as bad as um, some of the boxers, um, poor guys, what they go through as well um, to uh, make their weight. But um, eating the right food extremely important because then that way you can um, it helps you throughout your training. You know what I mean? Um, so with training, our, our training consists of pretty much, to be honest with you, everything. You know, like uh, from uh, from a recovery point of view, we do a lot of swimming. Um, uh, we do bike riding a lot in the off season. Um, so, and I'm talking long bike rides. Um, you're talking, you know, 40, 50, 60 k's. Um, so we do uh, weights in the off season about three times a week. Um, you know, obviously that's you know your whole body. Um, speed work, boxing we do, um, uh, cardio we do. Uh, you know, pretty much. Um, uh, wrestling we do so there's a lot of things that go into it um uh, although you're playing the game of rugby league but there's so much elements that uh connects it together if you know what i mean um you know a lot of video sessions watching yourself your team and the opposition team as well so there's a there's a 
there's a fair bit that goes into that. The rehab is in- extremely important always. You know, your little niggles you have to look after uh, to make sure, um, you know, the stretching um, is, is, is extremely um, important as well to be able to sort of always stay flexible to avoid injuries. So there's a lot, a, a lot that goes into it. So I also wanted to ask because um, in Ramadan, like you've spoken a lot about sort of the training that you've um, you've you've played rugby while you've done Ramadan, which is would definitely be a lot more intense. And I don't, I can't recall, but I think it would have been preseason as well. So you're probably even training harder than maybe um, in other times of the year. So would you be able to kind of walk us through like how it is sort of fasting and and playing a high intense sport like uh, rugby league and the sort of did you have to change your sort of um, diet and the way you did things compared to the rest of the year and how much like harder was it? In general, yeah. Look, the, to me, that was the hardest period, um, especially at the time when I was playing. Um, we used to it was summer, so uh, sorry uh, when we used to train off season. Off, off season training is a lot more tougher than actually playing some of the games because I, with the games, sometimes it could go all your way, or sometimes it goes the other way. For example, so you 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 get involved as much as you can um, um, in particular moments. Um, but the training was extremely difficult, especially because it was summer and off season, and you practically do five, six days on with one day off, and um, a lot of that consists of, like I said beforehand, like, you know, what I mean, a lot of running, a lot of everything's on time, a lot of speed work, and that when you do speed work, that drains you. It practically, you know, what I mean, for an hour say of speed work, whatever, just drains everything out of you and you're talking you know, 35 36 38 degrees and sometimes we'll do sprint work at um on the track which is a rubber rubber track and that rubber track when the sun hits it it's actually it's like it's baking a baking underneath you and you know and the sun is baking you from the top um so again you know dehydration was always sort of there that i had to make sure that at night I always sort of drank heaps of water, heaps, you know, and um, and and just loaded up on um, some carbs, getting ready for the next day. But was it tough? Extremely da- tough, you know. Lost a lot of kilos throughout that. Um, uh, they kept look at, at the beginning. I didn't know how hard it was or what it was like. Um, I had to sort of. Um, I didn't complain the first sort of time I I, I sort of did it or two. Um, although they they didn't know exactly what it was until we sort of. Um, you know, started talking about it a little, uh, a lot more, and I formed a good relationship with the trainer because he saw how I always had a go. So it's always there's, it's always important the trust factor from you know people's perspective because in that way, um, they they, are, they will give you leniency um, in return to obviously you know something else, which is you know your hard work and all that. So um, you know Billy Johnston at the time was the trainer for the club. Uh, he was renowned for his you know toughness and extremely tough um, uh, conditioner uh, and um, I, you know I had a chat to him after the, I think the first or second time um, or, or when I was doing Ramadan and I told him how difficult it was and the dehydration and that and if uh, and I asked him if you if you would allow me to actually do my second session on my own uh, as in for weights. And um, he said to me, look, no problem. I, I have all the trust in you. Here's the program. Go and do that, for example, I know. So um, that become after, as I said, the second year or third year, um, which the, the first is a couple of years was extremely difficult, but still, it was still is because we were eating at 8.30, you know. So I'd go out, for example, and do sprint training or whatever it is or ball work and all that, and you're out in the sun all day for about two hours, dehydrated. I couldn't even, to be honest, we go back home or sleep or because that's how dry my mouth would be. So, um, um you know, I'd have cold, you know, I'd, I'd jump in the shower and, and just let the cold water, you know, just run on top of me for about 20 minutes just to actually get my skin to cool down a bit. Um, and, um, you know, again, I started doing this, you know, the second sessions on my own uh, for weights um, until the month of Ramadan was over. And, um, and yeah, look, you know, again, formed a good relationship with the trainer and he knew exactly that, you um, you know, I'm here not to muck around, but I've still got my um, religious belief that I have to sort of practice. Um, they respected that and um, and sort of try to monitor as much as I can because, as I said, throughout the, the years, it's, it's sort of, you know, it gets tougher and tougher because 
training is always increasing. There was even one time uh, we had a camp in Canberra for three or four days, and one of the days we had to ride 100 k's, which took us four hours. Although the purpose of that was mainly mental, it wasn't. Um, of course, it was physical, but it wasn't meant to be, um, you know, going, say, 100 miles an hour. It was meant to just stay as a group and riding for four hours um, to be able to sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, condition your mind for, um, you know, to sustain it for, for a long period of time, you know what I mean, uh, uh, throughout the games and throughout whatever. So four hours is, is a lot of time to bike ride, if you know what I mean, especially when you're fasting, you know. So, and look, the amount of respect you gain from your teammates was enormous too because they're struggling and they can drink and eat and when they look at me and they think wow how is this guy doing it you know what i mean so and then they start to ask the questions and open up uh, opens up all these conversations about uh, what do you what is it what do you do it for and all that so um again you know uh, a lot of the ex-players now that you talk to and now they still can't believe that I, you know what I, sort of the way I used to do it through the season and um, and the respect is just enormous in between all of us. Spanala, that's crazy, crazy regime. Like I can barely bike ride for like twenty minutes, and you're here talking about four yeah. hours. So yeah. Spanala, like and during Ramadan as well. Like yeah. was the team or the coach or the sort of higher ups or the management ever sort of concerned because they may have thought you know if you're not eating and you know you're playing games for example or training you know this is going to affect like potentially the team performance did you have those sort of things to deal with where people will be kind of um, doubting your abilities during um, Ramadan specifically because of all that sort of not eating at all and all that sort of stuff yeah look to me I just didn't want any excuses I I didn't want to make I didn't want to make them and I don't don't want to I didn't want them to have them against me, if you know what I mean. Because unfortunately, in in any game, you know what I mean, uh, or, or any any in as that corporate or business or whatever, if you leave yourself exposed, although you're doing it for the right cause and for your religion, it's they're always going to use that somehow, or, uh, you know, against you. You know, oh, you're not having a go, or um, you know, later on it goes, but you know, look your attitude and that. So to me. I always wanted to eliminate that. That's why I just kept going as hard as I could and kept up with them. And I just suffered later. You know, a lot of them couldn't tell on my face, you know, on my face, or couldn't tell because I was, as I said, competing and having a go and um, everything was seemed to be as usual and normal. But yeah, inside of me, I was, I was hurting, mate. You know, I was, uh, I was definitely hurting in that. Although they kept an eye and they always, you know, they'll come up after training or during, uh, uh, everything okay? You need anything? No, I'm, look, I'm, I'm fine. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. You know, no problem. But again, as I said, inside, I was definitely hurting, mate. Well, you know, and and, it, and I'm actually lost for words because that's just you know ridiculous. But in the sense, but you know, alhamdulillah, you got through it. Oh, no. And I guess look, where there's a will, you know, you you you're gonna you have to you have to have a will there. You have to have um, faith. You know, your faith towards Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and what the cause you're doing it for. So a lot of a lot of people, I had a few guys going, you know, well, we can do that. We'll do it for one session. You know what I mean? 15 minutes later with the heat and all that, they're, they're the first ones with the cold water in their mouth. And I just laughed. And um, and because there's no purpose behind it. But alhamdulillah, we know what we're doing it for. We know the wisdom behind it. We know um, how good it is to actually for the body, uh, you know, from a cleansing uh, perspective and all that. So um, if you know the wisdom behind something, that's the, that's the drive that you'll always get. So don't just do something and not know why because someone else does it. No, do it knowing the purpose behind it, why it happens. And subhanAllah, in Islam, everything we do, and I talk and I say it again, everything we do, subhanAllah, has a purpose behind it or wisdom behind it. Definitely. And it's about, you know, holding strong with those that faith and that belief and, and powering through, which you definitely have sort of exhibited um, throughout your career for sure and i guess one thing i didn't want to i haven't mentioned yet that i do want to ask you about is because you mentioned a few times about injuries and dealing with injuries like um throughout your career if i recall you know you had a continuing lower back problem or some hamstring injuries as well and i assume that that does play like a huge inhibiting factor when it comes to playing um sport and being in in nrl because in the sense that it's always perhaps something in the back of the mind that you have to deal with where you have that injury if you had that injury and then you're sort of playing the game and you're just like look i can't be as free flowing with my body um in the game because this might potentially happen so could you maybe um touch on the sort of struggles when it comes to um dealing with those injuries and how did you overcome it and on sort of 
um, also explain how mentally you had to put that to the side when it came to actually playing the game and not worrying about those um, previous injuries that you've had? Yeah, look, um, injuries are always going to play a part in your performance. Um, uh, look, the worst ones, you know, obviously I got is the L4, L5 towards the end of my career and um, the last two years. And it made it so hard to actually... Um, you know, run or be explosive and all that without the, sort of the pain. Um, you know, uh, again, you, you know, the, the, the resilient bit plays a part to be able to sort of deal with that. Um, uh, and although that is extremely da- tough because you just can't perform to your capacity, you know, you're, you're sort of limited in a way. You rely on your experience. Um, maybe you rely on being on a, you know, in the, in the, in the sort of, right position because of your experience yeah there's no doubt you're gonna you're gonna get caught out even now and then because it's such an elite sport uh, and a fast sport um so look alhamdulillah again as i said I'll, i've been blessed with injuries although it's little ones here and there um and like some of the toughest ones that people for example don't see is that um, as a goal kicker for example uh, for about three to four five for about yeah four to five weeks i had actually uh, like a 15 centimeter 15 centimetre centimetre uh, tear in my right hammy, which is obviously the the, the leg that I kick. Um, you know, and you know, you're faced with kicks from the sideline, and you know, you still sort of, you know, you want to take them, although it's it's painful, but you still want to, you know, you go through them if you know what I'm saying. Um, uh, you know, left ankle, left ankle is extremely important as a goal kicker because that's the one you sort of plant, you stabilise, you know, yourself on, and you rotate and balance on. Um, especially the rotation, because you know, being a goal kicker, especially around the corner, sort of top and curving, you need to rotate a lot more. So having that sort of ligaments um, in your left ankle and um, and trying to kick, oh my, that's one of, one of the most painful things, and it's always in the back of your mind. So, and you miss a couple, and that's what I talk about, sort of some of the um, you know doubts that kick in and all that, because from little injuries like that that people don't see. And don't talk about, but you going internally, or you're, you're sort of uh, suffering with, and just waiting from uh, which injuries like that they take three, four, five, six weeks to sometimes get better, uh, uh, unless you you know you keep sort of uh, re-injuring. And um, yeah, so these are the little um, that uh, injuries that you keep picking up along the way. But so obviously, the, as I said, in my last two years, uh, in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, um, the back problem played a a bit because that was tapping into my hammies and tapping into my everything else. So I couldn't just, you know, fl- free flow. For sure. And I know we've talked a lot about your struggles and, you know, Mel award you immensely and, you know, a lot of lessons to derive from it. And I also wanted to also ask like one or two last questions, but I wanted to end on a high note as well. Like what would you say is like the highlight of your career? Would you say maybe it's, um, I assume the premiership in 2004, would play would be a special one and also when you were like all-time um point scorer um but what what's your sort of um high point in your career you reckon yeah look look alhamdulillah man i you know i look back and sometimes you go oh we could have won more, more premierships or we could have done this we could have done that but but you know i think the days alhamdulillah I mean, everything happens for a reason um mm-hmm. you know from an individual perspective i was able to break probably you know, eighty percent of probably records at, at a club at a, such a successful club like the Bulldogs, where um, you know it's uh, over ninety years old. So um, to be able to sort of play the most games there, most records, most points, most tries, most everything, alhamdulillah, that that I left the legacy there for the younger guys to 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 look up and go, you know what, look, um, um, you know, if Hazem can do it, we can as well. So um, uh, from an individual perspective, alhamdulillah, you know, what I mean that that was. Uh, you know that's incredible, and, and and I'm grateful. Alhamdulillah, that it happened that way. Obviously, playing Origin was, um, you know, uh, one of the highlights as well. And playing for Australia, um, uh, another highlight as well. I captain Lebanon as well in the World Cup. Um, you know, a couple of individual highlights, but ultimately, it's winning a grand final. That's what you strive for. That's something that you sort of want as a player. Um, you know, uh, to celebrate something like that with your teammates and your community itself. You know, I can never forget um, once the siren went and, you know, after we jumped on sort of the, the, the bus and came back to, say, Belmore uh, and the league club and just seeing so many 
familiar faces there and so happy and joyful you know so uh, people love success and um and again as i said winning the grand final is 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 definitely the highlight i recall like an iconic picture where i think you had i think it was your daughter on um on your back as well um as you took the photo with the rest of the team so there's a very uh, iconic moment in in 2004 as well yeah because um, I mean, yeah um, worked out well that um uh, she was able to be. She still looks back on it now and goes, you know, and <laughs> she teaches her brother and, and sister anyway. So she goes, I want a grand final. So. <laughs> <laughs> Mashallah. <laughs> and um, also, I wanted to ask, like, who do you think is the best player that you've played alongside with, or and also against? Like, oh, look, yeah. Honestly, a t- tough question. You know, a really tough question. But um, look, play a play against um, probably uh, you know Andrew Johns. Um, I, I I just think um, he, he's such a, a all round player um, from you know attack defensively. Um, he can turn the game. Uh, you know, turn the game around. Well. And um, yeah, it's just one of these guys that demands sort of success from his teammates as well. Um, is a is a and he's a great leader. Um, from you know playing with, uh, it, look, it's hard to say honestly because there's a lot of quality players that are you know that you play with, and everybody sort of has something more special than the other ones. You know, you're always going to get your sort of, you know, your halfback, five eights, playmakers that, you know, mean more obviously skillful and that, you know, um, and you're going to get a sort of around. But probably look, um, now up there will be Sonny. Sonny is up there. He's just, he, he attracted two, three defenders every time he touched the ball. He can offload defensively. He was brilliant, um, you know, and he can, he was always an X factor. He can always do things, you um, to turn a game around as well, you know what I mean. So, um, uh, you know, Sonny's one of probably one of the most, you know, like I said, skillful and 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 top players. Um, um, one of the toughest would be that I played with is probably Marco Mealy. You know, this guy never took a step back at anyone. You know what I mean? Um, uh, Character wise, William Mason. You know what I mean? Um, you know, ball skills, show one. So there's a lot of, as I said, players and different. Um, and different, you know, part of the game and that. But uh, probably look all around, yeah, I'd, I'd say Sonny. Um, he was just sort of, um, he was tough, you know. He was tough and he was um, uh, he was skillful at the same time, you know, both in defence and attack. Random question to add because a lot of people actually didn't know or may not know that you played with Sonny back in the early days. Like this was bec- in the sense that a lot of the Muslim community will now know Sonny Bill Williams because of his, you know, high profile social media and all the stuff that he does um, publicly. And so you've actually, you actually played with him um, and I don't think he was a Muslim at that time. So my random question is like, did you, did he ever, you know, ask you or come up to you and ask you about your faith? For example, when you were like, you said you were fasting and people were curious or did you ever, you know, talk to him about anything or did you even have a role <laughs> to some degree when it comes to Dawa in general when it comes to Sonny Bill? Yeah, look, w- with that Sonny and all the other boys, one thing I'd done, I never lectured, okay? I never preached. What I'd done is I let my actions do the talking and that invited conversations. They, they'll they come up, oh, you having a beer has? No, I don't drink. Why? And then, you know, go into it. Um, you know, when we go away and, hurt, for example, um, it took eight, it took seven to eight years for me to actually then ask um, the club and that. So when we go, say, New Zealand or Brisbane or Melbourne to play away games, they started providing halal food. And the boys would go, halal? What's what's halal food, you know? So, again, then you go into one, you, you tell them. Um, you know, obviously Ramadan comes and you're fasting. What are you doing that for? You know what I'm saying? Then you go into one, you explain, you know, you you're, and they're like, oh, okay, that makes a lot of sense. So there is so many ways, avenues, alhamdulillah, that, you let them come to you, you know, instead of, you know, but, um, in that environment, people don't want to be lectured or preach or you're doing the wrong thing or whatever it is. But you know what? You do it in a subtle way. When it comes to you, you tell them and um, uh, and, and they accept them. Like, for example, one one particular guy I remember till now, I never forgot, he, he, he was on a drink, he drove his car and he actually flipped his car, one of the young guys. And then, you know, a boy himself, he come up and goes, you know what has? Now I know why you guys don't drink. You know what I mean? So I thought, wow, you know, I mean, at least, he, you know, he learned the lesson the hard way, but at least he knows. That, that that doesn't mean he stopped drinking. He still probably drinks now, but at least 
um, at least they know, you know, I hope you know what I'm saying. So, um, but yeah, particularly with Sonny, um, look, he was always obviously observant, um, you know, oh, we, we won premierships together with Sonny in 2004. Um, and he, he left the club in 2008, you know, so, and then I retired obviously in 2009. Um, but yeah, look, we were always good friends. Um, there's no doubt about that. Uh, and Hamda, we used to always, for example, meet up with, um, uh, sometimes with Anthony Mundane, Kota Nasa, some of the boys there, you know. Um, um, uh, for me, brother, look, again, as I said, I, I never lectured and all that. I, all, all I've done is I just went about my own action and, um, and, you know, some of them observed and saw and, um, and, um, you know, again, as I said, um, hopefully Sonny is sort of saw and he liked, but, um, but I think the most credit goes to the boys he was with. I think Kota Nass and all the boys that, um, uh, that, uh, Alhamdulillah played the role and, um, you know, he started asking the right questions, felt in Alhamdulillah, you know, comfort with the boys and, and, uh, but again, look, Lane, to everybody out there listening, um, you don't have to be always the person to make, um, uh, to make uh, uh, th- th- all the difference, you know, having your s- little input here and there plays a role because when these people recall back, they go, oh, okay, look, I know now, I can see now, for example, maybe has them or whatever. Not, I'm not giving myself credit, please. I'm not trying to say that, but I'm just trying to say it. sometimes when you plant the seed, it'll grow and then people will always come back and think to themselves, look, I remember, for example, if I, I, I'm saying what I'm saying is that if I was a bad Muslim it wouldn't, uh, or anybody, it wouldn't attract that person um, moving forward that already is interested. You know, it, it, I hope you know what I'm saying. So, therefore, if you just plant that seed and alhamdulillah go about your business, people are always intrigued to ask the question, and that's how they show interest. So it's just about that little invitation is always there without you pushing for it. For sure. Um, I know I've been uh, going over a bit of your time, but I do want to ask one final question um, yeah. that we ask like to all our guests that come on the show. And it's always um, a diverse set of answers. I'm looking forward to yours, uh, hearing um, who you pick. So if you were to hear, um, chill with three people in a cave, because you know, the name of our podcast is Boys in the Cave, who would they be? Like they can't be just for diverse sort of answers. Like they can't be like, you know, prophets or Sahaba, for example, yeah. but like who, who uh, they could be past or present, um, living, or dead, um, who who would you hang out with in a cave to have a good chat uh, yeah, with? Yeah, yeah. I, I could, look, Muhammad Ali would be one of them. Um, you know, always been a big fan, um, and alhamdulillah, what he's done um, for Islam and for himself as well. Malcolm X would be another one, um, and uh, and Michael Jordan. <laughs> Mashallah, yeah, there'll be a crazy, like, dope cave as well yeah, in, yeah. in that sense, Ma- getting the most out of them. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll convert MJ, eh? <laughs> That's else to go, right? He's in the cave with us. Maybe you can um you know reach out to him now, inshallah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but um Zakalak here for coming on Boys in the Cave. It was a really amazing discussion and just the reason why it means a lot to me is because um one of my vivid memories when I was a childhood, uh, when I was a young kid, was that I actually as I think I was in kindergarten year one where I the school took us to a Bulldogs training camp. So I, it was you, it was Sonny Bill there, it was Willie Mason. I was a really young kid, so you know, especially knowing that you know you're Muslim and stuff, that I obviously looked up to you in that sense. But who would have thought as well, like someone like Sonny Bill, like many years later would convert to Islam as well. Um, so you know that that's a special kind of memory that I have in in back of my mind. Um, so it was an honor to you know be able to do this episode with you, and I hope you enjoyed your time as well. Uh, brilliant, bro. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And I, again, sorry about, about it taking too long, but um, alhamdulillah, it's done now. And inshallah, I we'll look forward to catching up with you again, inshallah. Having a, a nice um, coffee and we'll go from there, inshallah. For sure. I'll just wrap it up now. So for our listeners, thank you for giving us your attention. If you have any questions or queries, feel free to email us at infoboysinthecave.com. You can find us on Facebook and we're active on Instagram, Twitter as well. So definitely check us out there. Um, please leave a five-star rating on iTunes because that helps us a lot, inshallah, and help us you know, go up the rankings on iTunes. Um, so for our special guests, um, Hazem Al-Mazri and myself, we wish you all the best. This is Tanzim signing off. Assalamualaikum.